Today we're going to talk about my February wrap up and all of the books that I read in February. So let's get into it right now. So the first book I read, Yavola by Jennifer Thorne, and this is a gothic haunted house story. It comes out this month, follows this family, they go on vacation to Italy, you know, it's beautiful, there's wine, it's all it's history and so much art. They go and they stay in this like 600 year old farmhouse. And the guy who's the caretaker of it, like, hey, you know, free reign of the property, but do not go in this tower room. And here's the key to the tower room. <laughs> so what do you think is going to happen? Someone's going to open it. They're dumb. And then the crap hits the fan and it's crazy. And I absolutely loved it. It was such a good read. So after that... I read a paranormal nonfiction called We Are Not Alone by Mark Hartsman. And it basically talks about all kinds of different UFO cases from some of the most famous ones, you know, with Roswell and Betty and Barney Hill and Rendlesham and the Pascagoula incident and a whole lot of those. But then it also comes up right into present day with a lot more modern ones that I hadn't read about and hadn't heard about before. So that was pretty cool. And the way it's written, it is interesting and it captivated my attention and just as someone who's interested in that subject matter it was a really great read so if you're not interested in that i wouldn't recommend it. but if you are i would definitely recommend it so after that one i read this wretched valley by jenny kiefer and the person that wrote this he owns the bookstore Butcher Cabin Books in kentucky which is a horror bookstore which is really cool it is I think about 12 hours away but i really want to check it out but anyways this book was awesome it's super creepy it freaked me out because i like to go camping and this takes place kind of like here in the woods there's this valley that they camp out in obviously the wretched valley and so the story follows a group of people one guy's working on uh getting his degree in college and so he wants to go and find different spots to map out for people who are rock climbers to go and climb. So he's out with his friend on a plane and they have LIDAR. And what LIDAR does is it kind of takes away all the trees and plant life so that you can see any like rock structures and stuff underneath. They've used it to find new Mayan runes and stuff, like in reality, thought on National Geographic. But anyways, so this guy, they use this, they find this spot in Kentucky. Super excited about it. It looks like it's going to be really great. He hits up one of his friends who is a rock climber that just got sponsored. So she's really excited that she's going to be like able to map this first climb before anyone else can find it. Then he brings along another lady and she is basically like a botanist and has a wealth of knowledge about different plant life and this, that, and the other. And also the climber, her boyfriend comes and they bring their dog as well. And so... They go out into the woods and they seem to have quite a hard time finding this area and getting to the area where this big rock wall is. It seems like they're just going through the same spot in the forest over and over again, but that can't be possible, right? Right? Eventually they find the valley and find the rock wall. Everyone's excited. It looks really freaking cool. It looks great. Stuff starts to get weird. And uh, if you're interested to hear more about this book, I do have a standalone review of it, and I will link that down below. So after that, we read The Thriller No One Can Know by Kate Alice Marshall. And I'd read this author before. I'd read one of her other books called What Lies in the Woods, and I loved it. Her style of writing, it's super fast paced. It keeps you guessing and on your toes about what happened, and No One Can Know is no different. I kept guessing and I kept coming up wrong and that's a great sign when you're reading a thriller because you don't want to know who did it right away like if you're right right off the bat it kind of sucks some of the life out of it you know so no one can know there is three sisters and one night their parents are found murdered in their house and the sisters are all being under suspicion of possibly being the ones who murdered their parents they never end up quite having all the evidence built up against any of the sisters to like pin it on one of them but it seems that one of the sisters more than the others has taken and shouldered more of the blame and they all moved away they were all separated after this happened they ended up in different foster homes and whatnot one sister 
her and her husband just found out she's pregnant. They have nowhere to go. And so the sisters all still own the parents' house. And so the one sister and her husband are going to go and stay at the house where her parents were murdered. Like she tried to separate herself from all of that the skeletons in her closet. Just that's the last thing on earth she wants. She doesn't want to bring her husband into that. She doesn't want him to know anything. But that seems to be the only thing they're going to be able to do with the situation that they're in. So they go back there and that dredges up all these old skeletons in the closet. And then the other sisters come back into the story. And then they start trying to figure out who actually did it. Was it one of the sisters or was it someone else? And it was like at every turn I was like, oh, it's totally this person. And then it wouldn't be so wrong the whole time. And it was great. I had a really fun time with it. I do I have a standalone review of that one too. Link that down below as well. After that, I read my first V.E. Schwab book, and that was The Fragile Threads of Power. And apparently this is a spin-off of the series The Shades of Magic, which I have not read. Obviously, if this was my first one would assume I have not read the other trilogy. So reading this without reading that. I felt it stood on its own two feet really well. I didn't feel like I needed to read the other ones, which I may still go back and read them, but honestly, you get filled in of enough of the backstory that this story totally stands on its feet by itself. So there's four London, black, white, gray, and red. And they're kind of like different dimensions. And there used to be doors between them. In each world, some of the magic is being born again. Some is completely burnt out. Some is waning. Some is waxing. After a while, you know, you can't just keep magic in. It's going to start bursting through at the seams, this, that, and the other, and whatnot. On one child queen, and where she is, it seems like the magic's coming back and blossoming again. And then you have this other kingdom. The magic is starting to wane, and the people are starting to point fingers at the king and blaming it on him because he doesn't have magic, so that must be why the land is, you know being drained of magic or doesn't have as much. And so this group rises up called the Hand and they're gonna try to overthrow the king. And there's all kinds of, you know, magic and weirdness and quirky characters. There's pirates and there's this one character, Tess the Tinkerer, and she has this bone owl that she talks to that's magically enchanted and she's a fixer of things. She has this rare ability where she can see the threads of power and some people have that ability. She can actually like manipulate them and touch them. As you might guess, she's going to be a major player in the story. And I absolutely love this book. I can't wait to read the next one. No idea when it comes out. Maybe next year. Not really sure. I had a good time with it. If you like fantasy, if you like magic and strange magical systems and quirky characters, then it might just be for you. After that, we read a manga called A Guest in the House by Emily Carroll. The artwork is great. I don't know what happened still. I enjoyed it though, but the the beginning is really sad. There's this woman and she marries into this family and she just kind of like married this guy, but I don't think she really loved him. She just liked the attention. And so she has now a stepdaughter. The stepdaughter, the mother died and apparently the dad told her that she died of cancer when she finds out later it was suicide. But then she starts seeing the ghost of the mother. She starts seeing the ghosts of the mother. She starts talking to this entity who kind of like lives in the water. There's a lake outside of their little cabin where she lives and I'm not really sure if she is the actual mother or some other entity but stuff goes off the rails and it gets really weird. If you like weird stories that at the end you don't really know what happened <laughs> that leaves you kind of like guessing I, you might like it. I enjoyed my time with it I didn't love it, but I didn't dislike it. I would have liked a little more idea of what happened. It was weird. That's all I got. After that, I got to return to one of my favorite fantasy worlds. I've been around the channel. You may have heard me talk about Daughter of the Moon Goddess and Heart of the Sun Warrior, which is a duology by Su Lin Tan. You recently just came out with a third book called Tales of the Celestial Kingdoms. It's nine stories and it brings you back into those worlds in both of those books and you get like some further stories on some of the mythology that was in the books and then you get a little bit more backstories on some of the other characters and then you also get an epilogue goes into a little more detail of what happened and it was so great just to be able to go back to the magic of that world and that realm had a lot of fun with it. It's short. It's a novella. It's under 200 pages. And if you read the duology, I am pretty sure you'll enjoy this one as well. Also, 
It has an absolutely gorgeous cover. And this series of books seriously has like the prettiest covers ever. Some of the special editions, ridiculously gorgeous. So after that, we read Cross of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. Every once in a while, I gotta throw in a Brandon Sanderson book in there. And I always have a good time. They're always fun. This one was a little weird. And when I first started reading it, I was like, why is the narrator insane? Why is it so goofy and ridiculous? You learn why. But at first, I was just like, what is happening? I don't know if I like this. <laughs> so you come into the story. It's about this girl named Glorf. And I know this book is called Tress of the Emerald Sea. Her real name is Glorf, which she doesn't go by at all in this whole book. But you're just informed that her name's Glorf. She goes by Tress, which is a nickname because of the tresses of her hair. Tress likes to collect cups from, you know, sailors who go to these different lands and they bring her cups that she keeps in a collection and all that stuff. She has a friend named Charlie. Charlie is the Duke's son. And he's not really supposed to be friends with the commoners, I guess, but him and Tress still hang out. Until one day when his dad, who is a-hole, decides that Charlie needs to go get married to, like, some princess of the land because, you know, politics and political families. Anyway, so they ship off. And before he leaves, he does promise her that he will not marry anyone else. Because, well, they're in love. So, when the Duke returns, Charlie is not with him. The Duke comes back with, like, his other nephew, and they're a little, like, unclear about it, but they're like, oh, Charlie went off to sail the Midnight Seas to um, confront the sorceress. And so this seems a little fishy and suspicious, and it seems like his dad wanted to just have him, like, killed off, because he didn't really like his own son. So, Tress has never left this island her whole life, but love does some crazy things, you know? And she decides that she is going to go save Charlie. How's she gonna do this? No idea. But she stumbles her way through it, and it's great. As you get into the story, as I said, the narration was like, the narrator is like an insane doofus. And so, you're getting further into the story. And at this point in time, Press ends up on this other boat. And all of a sudden, the narrator pops into the story and his name is Hoyd and Hoyd is insane. He's insane because he's encountered the sorceress of the Midnight Sea before and she put a curse on him. And so Hoyd might actually be helpful, but Hoyd does like to say absolutely deranged things and his fashion sense is a hot mess, but it's so charming and so ridiculous. And the charmingness and ridiculousness just wraps around you and pulls you into this goofy, magical, whimsical story. And I had so much fun with it. It was a great standalone, and I would highly recommend it. You've been forewarned about the narrator. Well, after that, I read a nonfiction book called Why We Read by Shannon Reed. I'm always interested in why people read. And she has a background as a teacher and basically teaches English. A lot of that is having people read different books and talking about reading and that and the other and the different chapters were a lot of fun there was like my favorite was the one that was like the 13 ways that I choose my next read and it was like all these kind of like ridiculous things that I myself have done first figure out the genre of book then define it down a little closer to a niche go to the bookstore and say hello to the bookseller that you know by name Head on over to the section where the type of book you want lies, but get distracted by three other things in the bookstore. Then find yourself reading cookbooks and end up with three cookbooks in your arm as you start to head over to the fiction section when you originally were going to go over to the fantasy and then finally make your way to where you originally wanted to pick up this book. Pick it up, look at the cover, read the inside, look at the cover again. Flip it over, look at the back. And it was just really funny because I know I've done most of these things. It's humorous, it's funny. If you are a reader, a writer, a booktuber, this is a book that you would definitely enjoy if you like nonfiction and books. After that, I read a super weird book. This is a paranormal nonfiction called Theater of the Mind by Dave Schrader. And this book has 15 different stories that are possibly true. They talk about aliens, monsters, UFOs, psychic occurrences, like just really weird stuff. Some are terrifying 
and will keep you up at night, especially because they're supposed to be true. Sometimes that freaks me out more than horror. Read it during the day. And if you're reading it at night, maybe not by yourself when you're home alone. And I will have a standalone review for this coming. I'm not sure if it will be up before this video or not. But if you want to learn more about that book, I go into more specifics of the actual stories that really freaked me out. Then uh, standalone review. Definitely check that out when that pops up. After that, The Warm Hand Goes by Catherine Arden. And I picked this book up because I had been seeing it on Instagram everywhere. It ran right into my face at the library. I walked up to the new book section and it was literally like right there. I was like, I've been seeing this all over Instagram. Come with me. <laughs> I really didn't know what to expect. It had the word ghost in the title. And so it takes place during 1917 and 1918 during World War I. It tells the story of this brother and sister, Freddie and Laura. Laura's a nurse. Freddie's a soldier. Laura ends up getting injured and then goes back home to Canada and tragedy strikes. Shortly after this, she's sent a box with like his effects in it. And the letter says he's missing, but they presume he's dead. He ends up being inside this pillbox, which flipped over upside down. And that was like a artillery housing thing, which is cement and heavy and like that thing upside down, there's not really a way to get out of it. And so when he comes to in the darkness, he's in there with this German guy, Hans Winter. They both are just kind of laying there waiting for death to come because they assume the air is going to run out and they're not going to be able to get out. But it seems there are rats that somehow arrived in there and they haven't died after a certain time and there's still air coming in there. So there might still be hope yet. They end up digging themselves out through the mud and they make it out. And, you know, they're not supposed to be together because they're enemies. But you go through something like that. And that enemy becomes your brother. And so they make it out of there. Laura wants to know what happens because she doesn't believe he's dead, especially since they're like he's missing. So there's still that fine thread of hope. She starts writing letters to different people that she knew over there. A lot of people just kind of say the same thing, but then she gets this one letter from this lady that she used to work with, that she was a nurse with, and it's very cryptic. And it leads her to believe that this woman knows something. So Laura is determined, and since she has nothing left for her at home, with her family being killed, she decides she's going to go back over, if there's a chance that her brother's still alive. The third part to this story. There is a man called the Fiddler. They say that you only find him once. He has wine, that it will take away your sorrows and bad memories. But he doesn't take payments and money takes something that is far more precious. And this fiddler trusts Freddy and take Freddy away to a, uh, we'll call it a liminal place. Alora has to fight to find and bring her brother back. And it is such an emotional, gut-wrenching and beautiful story. I loved it. It's so good. Don't always do the best with like war stories, but this one was so well done and just you feel for all the characters. It's so freaking good. I loved it. A lot of great variety this month. A lot of fantasy. I read a lot of nonfiction. We had a manga, horror, thrillers. I think, let's see, my favorite out of all these is probably The Warm Hands of Ghosts. Okay, let's go top three. And number three, we have Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. Second place, No One Can Know by Kate Ellis Marshall. That thriller was twisty and it kept me guessing and I was like wrong every time I guessed who it was. And then The Warm Hands of Ghosts. That was my number one out of all these. If you're a fan of videos where I talk about multiple things that I have read or am reading, next video coming up will be about that. So stick around, check it out. And if you had fun hanging out today, hit that subscribe button, come back, see me again, and we'll talk about more bookish things and weird stuff.